I think we have a stable audience now. Uh, thanks everyone for coming uh, and welcome to the second Consumer Pyramids Research Seminar. I am very pleased to have uh, Tarun Jain uh, from IIM Ahmedabad discussing his paper, Lights Out, COVID-19 Containment Policies and Economic Activity, uh, written jointly with Sonalika Sinha at the RBI and Robert C.M. Mayer at the World Bank's uh, South Asia Chief Economist Office. Uh, and discussing the paper, we have Prachi Mishra from the IMF. This is a very interesting paper. It combines many different data sets, uh, and I'm very excited uh, to, to see it. So um, Tarun, I'll hand it over to you. Just one quick note to the audience. Please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box. And as much as possible, uh, we'll try to get to all the questions once uh, Tarun is done and once Prachi's discussion is done. Thank you so much. Tarun, over to you. OK, great. Uh, so perhaps I can, if you want to share so great. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Kaushik, for inviting us to present our work. So this is a, a paper titled Lights Out COVID-19 Containment Policies and Economic Activity. And it's a joint work with Robert Bayer, who's from the World Bank, and Sonalika Sinha from the Reserve Bank of India. And so uh, grateful that they're both joining us here uh, to answer all the important and difficult questions. So uh, the motivation for this paper is uh, fairly, uh, you know, straightforward. Uh, we, you know, in the context of pandemics and other kinds of, uh, you know, health disasters, it's quite important for the government to intervene, right? So standard economics tells us that, especially in the case of communicable diseases, it's very difficult to resolve uh, these. Uh, uh, situations without any government intervention, and government intervention is quite critical uh, to mitigate the health impact of these pandemics. Now, in the case of COVID-19, um, as well as in previous pandemics, uh, the concern has always been that the government intervention uh, leads to um, uh, policies which restrain, say, mobility or other kinds of non-pharmaceutical interventions in order to uh, restrict the spread of the virus uh, further in Ahmedabad. And so, of course, you know, um, while there is a potentially positive effect of uh, the containment policies, we are, of course, concerned that the uh, containment policies also has a negative economic effect because of the restraints on mobility, um, other kinds of measures that the government takes. So here's what this paper is doing. It's a fairly straightforward paper. What we're going to do is that we're going to understand and understand uh, what has been the effect of the government containment policies in India as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in the context of one, a very specific episode of containment policies, which happened in May. Right? And what we're going to do is to provide with, uh, you with a district level aggregate economic effects. Right? So uh, this is a district level analysis, not a national level analysis. And what we're trying to do is to understand what was the net effect of government intervention on aggregate economic factors. So here's the essential research design. Uh, what we're going to do is to exploit the graded unlock strat uh, lockdown strategy during May 2020. Uh, this is the time when the government came up with uh, three zone classifications, uh, red and orange and green zones uh, across India. I'm going to tell you exactly what these involve. Uh, but the, uh, what we're going to do is that in May 2020, the government was came up with this graded unlock strategy, and what we're going to uh, we're going to estimate the impact of these unlock uh, strategies, the differential unlock strategies, on the economic output, primarily as measured by the nighttime light intensity. And I'm going to tell you why this is a good measure. We're also going to try and understand uh, the channels through which um, this had an effect. So, for example. To what extent did the uh, graded unlock strategy actually impact mobility of households, right? So we are going to look at localized mobility to check if the um, government intervention actually led to the restrictions on mobility as we would have imagined. Notice that this is localized mobility, whether someone went left their house or not, not uh, say long distance mobility, a migrant returning to their home. Uh, we are also going to see uh, the impact of these um, differential uh, lockdown strategies on household consumption and income. And this is where the consumer pyramids data is so useful. I'll tell you more. 
districts with red, the zone with the most severe restrictions. These are the red zone districts and compare them to the green zone districts. So that's the first difference, as well as the, uh, look at the difference before the unlock, uh, graded unlock was implemented. That's March and April to 2020 when the uh, containment policies were uniformly implemented all across the country compared to a post period, which is May, June, uh, 2020. And so try and see what was the impact of these differences and differences. So red compared to green, pre and post, and then of course, orange versus green, pre and post. So uh, this is the differences and different strategy that we're going to adopt in order to understand the impact of these differential lockdown strategies on um, aggregate economic activity. So here's the uh, quick summary of the findings. So uh, with the nighttime lights uh, uh, data shows that the uh, decline, so the uh, overall activity, overall uh, nighttime lights uh, intensity was recovering from April to May and June across the country. But the relative effect, the increase was 0.043 standard deviations lower in red zone districts. That translates into an 8.9% lower uh, recovery in the red zone districts compared to the green zone districts. And in the orange zone districts, this is uh, trans uh, this, uh, the main result is that the recovery was 0.009 standard deviations lower in the orange zone districts compared to the green zone districts. This is in percent terms, 1.5% lower nighttime light intensity in the orange zone districts compared to the green zone districts. Uh, this main finding, we're going to check against lots and lots of different uh, robustness checks. So first I'm going to try and see whether uh, there's a pre-period placebo. We're going to try and look at border effects. Um, we're going to exclude metropolitan areas, which disproportionately contribute to night lights. Um, reclassified districts. So some districts were reclassified from red to orange uh, or green to uh, orange. Uh, in the uh, during May itself, we're going to exclude those, check if that has an effect. And then finally, we're going to do some shuffle classification, uh, sort of a placebo test, if you may. Right? We're going to uh, check some channels. And we look at this data from Facebook, which tells us about small distance mobility, whether, say, someone left their homes or not. And we find that actually this is a plausible channel. Restrictions of mobility actually had, an, uh, had a bite. And so this matches the patterns of lockdowns, as we might expect. The second uh, uh, big result uh, on the channels is that the income was uh, affected in the red and orange zone districts. So the income implies both employment versus unemployment, as well as the level of wages. It's the combination of those two. And we see greater income declines um, in the red uh, and orange zone districts compared to the green zone districts. Uh, we see that the consumption was lower in May compared to April and March in uh, the red zone districts, but uh, in the June uh, data, it shows that it's rebounded. Right? So uh, it's uh, suggesting that the income effects were quite substantial and they persisted. The consumption, while initially low, was actually rebounded. Okay? We're going to also look at heterogeneity. We see that there's larger impacts of these um, uh, zone classifications in districts with greater population density, uh, with older residents, uh, as well as more services employment and bank credit as dispersed by bank. So that's the summary of the findings. And so let me now get into uh, explaining the timeline of events. So January uh, 30th is when India uh, is reporting the first confirmed COVID-19 case in India. Uh, in February and March, witnessed greater um, uh, travel restrictions, which were pretty much uniform across the country. Uh, you might, uh, so for example, international travelers were restricted um, on, of course, in the end of March, we had the Janta curfew, which was a one-day voluntary public curfew. Starting from March 25th to April 14th was a uniform national lockdown, which was then subsequently extended to May 3rd. So these are the first two uh, lockdowns. The key part over here is that the uh, nationwide, uh, these lockdown from March 25th all the way to May 3rd was uniform and did not have differential policies by district. On May 4th, starting May 4th, to uh, May 17th, uh, districts were assigned uh, to being uh, either red, orange, or green containment policies. So um, to explain this uh, more precisely, this uh, graded red zone districts had restrictions on public transportation, hospitality and entertainment were shut down. So uh, restaurants, uh, cinema halls were shut down, construction, risk retail, all these activities were banned. 
uh, e-commerce was only for essential goods. Private offices could operate with only one third of em uh, employees. So these were the restrictions in the red zone districts. In the orange zone districts, uh, you, uh, the same uh, red zone activities, the activities that were allowed in uh, the red zone were permitted in the orange zone districts. In addition, the orange zone districts also uh, allowed for public transportation. And so this is a, a considerable mobility restriction in, uh, sorry, uh, mobility relaxation in the orange zone districts. Finally, we have the green zone districts where all the activities were resumed except for those restricted nationally. So for example, transportation, which was inter-district was restricted in green zone districts. Uh, you could not fly a plane uh, to a green zone district, but otherwise all activities were resumed. Uh, so here's a map which shows you the distribution of these districts. Uh, you know, you see some green zone districts, uh, particularly uh, concentrated in the Northeast, but otherwise the way I interpret this map is to say that there are green, orange, and red zone districts all throughout the country. And there's, uh, you know, it's not obvious that all the orange zone, uh, all the red zone districts are necessarily in the North only or only in the West of India or something like that. But these are districts which are spread across all over the country, right? So this is the uh, may, uh, unlock um, the strategy in May 4 to May 17th. From um, so, uh, the graded unlock strategy from May 14th uh, 4 to May 17th, uh, this was extended subsequently for another two weeks, all the way till May 31st. From June 1st uh, onwards, uh, the, uh, the central government uh, said that the states could come up with their own specific policies. A lot of the restriction, uh, mobility restrictions were uh, handed over to the states and the states were making subsequent policies. So that's the unlock one and unlock two period. Our main uh, study period is going to be from March to the June. What we classify as a pre-period to these graded unlock strategies will consist of March and April 2020, and the post period will consist of May and June 2020. Um, and so uh, therefore, uh, so the June period we introduce as the post period, we'll just see if there's a path dependence of the graded, uh, the uh, zone classifications in the subsequent months as well. So I hope that the um, uh, point about what the policies were is clear. So now what I'm going to um, do is to tell you a little bit more about the data that we bring to bear uh, in the study. So the first uh, set of data that we have is our main outcome variable, which is nighttime light intensity. So this is a, uh, this is a measure uh, which is collected. This is data that is collected by uh, NASA satellites using cameras. And so every night uh, over India, as well as the rest of the world, these satellites are picking up the amount of light that there is. Uh, and so these, uh, so the literature, the macroeconomics literature is particularly latched on to these nighttime lights. And they said that these are a very good proxy for aggregate economic activity. Uh, there are important research papers that have examined this correlation between nighttime light intensity and other kinds of macroeconomic variables uh, for various economies around the world and have concluded these nighttime lights are a very reliable source of information on, night, uh, on macroeconomic activity uh, around the world. Uh, my uh, quarter study very proxy from it's not only true for the country overall, but even at the district level, uh, this holds. So even at high spatial granularity, nighttime light intensity is a good measure of macroeconomic. Um, there's other advantages of using uh, nighttime light intensity. The simple fact is that it's available at the district level. And so if you looked at say GDP in India as our measure that the government releases, the problem with the GDP numbers is that they're available only at the entire they're only available for the entire country. And if we wanted to uh, see them at a level, which is specific to a certain district, we wouldn't be able to do that uh, anytime soon. We'd have to wait for uh, disaggregated measures for a very long time. So um, we can actually take a look at nighttime light intensity. It is a good measure, it's available, and it was available fairly quickly. Uh, the GDP numbers at the uh, district level are released with a fairly long lag. And so this is, um, um, I think a big plus of nighttime lights. 
The third reason why we're looking at nighttime lights is that they are a fairly objective measure of night, uh, economic activity. The NASA satellites that are collecting data on nighttime lights are not doing this for specifically for measuring Indian GDP. So, you know, in that sense, it's an objective measure. Plus, the big uh, advantage is that it's free from a lot of reporting biases. So, for example, uh, imagine a survey based measure where you have surveyors go to households or go to firms to uh, collect data from them. You might imagine that the lockdown itself affected survey activities, and therefore we're getting a biased uh, understanding of what is happening in the economy. The big plus of these NASA satellites is that they were certainly not impacted uh, by this uh, lockdowns in India. And so therefore the non-response concerns is not so much, uh, you know, not so uh, important in the data set. So these are the reasons why we're looking at nighttime lights uh, as our main measure of uh, macroeconomic activities in India. We also use the consumer spirits uh, household survey. So, uh, you know, thanks Kaushik for, um, you know, helping us understand uh, this data set. It's a very high quality household panel data set. And so there are several advantages to using the uh, CPHS for this specific uh, study. The first advantage is that it's available. The events in this uh, paper happened only a few months ago and we already have the data available to us. So this nature, so uh, this timely availability of the data is a very big plus for, this, uh, uh, for uh, coming up with a research study, which is fairly real time in nature. If you relied on say other sources, for example, the National Sample Survey, which is also a very high quality data set, we'd have to wait for a long time before the National Sample Survey was released at the household level. And so therefore, uh, you know, we would not be able to get the study out to you so quickly. So the timely availability of this consumer pyramid survey is a big plus. It's available at the monthly level. So remember, a lot of the GDP estimates are uh, reported at the uh, in three month chunks at the quarterly level. For a study that is essentially taking place month by month, it would be impossible to use uh, you know quarterly GDP estimates to look at the effects of April versus May. In contrast, the consumer pyramid survey is available monthly, so that's a big plus as well. Uh, the National Sample Survey, uh, you know, again, uh, is only available at the annual level. So the Consumer survey, Pyramid Survey uh, rounds being available at the monthly level is a big advantage in the study. We can, uh, the Consumer Pyramids uh, allows us to match households in the 2020 districts. So what has happened in India is that between 2011, which is when the last census was conducted, to current, uh, right now, there are many districts that have been created. So more than 146 districts have been created in India and uh, the consumer pyramid survey allows us to match each household to one of the 2020 districts. And so this means that we're not necessarily trying to, you know, losing a lot of statistical power or ignoring the fact that, you know, different districts um, are being created in the study. Remember the zone classifications are taking place at this 2020 district level. So we want to make sure that our households are also being classified according to the 2020. Um, there's several uh, advantages uh, further is that, uh, you know, it's a large number of observations that's always useful as someone who does econometrics and, uh, you know, the uh, fact that it's a panel allows us to put in household fixed effects and that also uh, adds to the quality of the analysis. So many reasons to use the consumer pyramid survey and, you know, more than happy to talk to you about how we've used the consumer pyramid survey in conjunction with many other data sources. So here are some of the other data sources that we've used. Um, obviously, the zone classifications have come from uh, official sources. So this is an appendix uh, of the official order, which specifies which district was classified according to which class. Um, the mobility data is from Facebook. So every time you have a, <coughs> a Facebook app and your location turned on, uh, Facebook is recording that information and coming up with tiles, uh, which are 600 meters by 600 meters around the world. And they're uh, providing this data um, at the aggregate district level to tell, uh, tell us, to tell researchers how many people move away from the tile or not. So this is a very localized measure of 600 meters by 600 meters. Essentially, we interpret this as saying how many people moved out of their immediate house or neighborhood compared to not, right? So uh, this is not, for example, a, a good proxy for long distance migration. 
So long distance migration will not be picked up by this uh, Facebook uh, data, but it's a good proxy for short distance mobility. Uh, COVID-19 infections. So in all our analysis, you'd, uh, we'd obviously have to control for the actual spread of the virus. And so we're using this uh, 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 website, which many of you might be familiar with, covid19india.org. And so they allow us to scrape off uh, the monthly district by district uh, infection. Uh, the demographic information from census 2011 um, is you know, compiled into a very nice data set by uh, Asher et al. And so this is the shrug data set. And many people might be familiar with this. And so we're using this uh, data as well. Uh, bank, uh, bank credit and deposits um, are from the RBI's database on the Indian economy. So this tells us uh, for a large number of quarters, uh, what was the um, amount of credit dispersed by the RBI uh, during this, uh, this period and previous periods. And so finally, we know uh, the services employment or the fraction of services employment in each district uh, from um, uh, the national sample survey. So this allows us to classify each district as having a high level of services employment or low level of services. I see, um, uh, I see a question on Facebook mobility data compared to Google mobility data. And so this straightforward reason why we prefer the Facebook mobility data is that the Google mobility data is only available at the state level. Many of the restrictions are actually uh, you know, taking place. So we want, and so we want to look in within state. And so we want to compare districts within a certain uh, state. And so um, the Google mobility data is only available at the state level, whereas the Facebook data is available at the district level, which is why we uh, chose for that. Uh, but I think um, perhaps one of my co-authors can answer the reliability of the Facebook data compared to the Google mobility data in mobile. So some summary statistics um, on this. Uh, so Vimal asked a question on, um, you know, how much of economic activity is coming from red, orange, and green zone district. Now, um, the if you look at uh, the number of infections, uh, they were obviously higher in the red zone districts. That's why, in some ways, uh, so for example, uh, the big metropolitan cities like Delhi, Mumbai, and Dabad even were classified as red zone districts for a good reason, they had the highest number of infections. These are also the places where the, the virus arrived first. So it's not surprising that they were uh, you know, internationally connected and therefore had higher GDP. Um, you can see this in some of the um, night lights data as well. Uh, the, you know, this is uh, night, a nanowatts per square kilometer of the night lights. This is much higher in the red zone districts, orange zone districts, but green zone districts. So one of the ways in which we're going to uh, account for this is to put in a district fixed effect uh, in our uh, specifications. Uh, I'm also going to uh, run uh, specifications and robustness checks, excluding the largest metropolitan uh, areas. We also, so this is the district level statistics um, and we also have the uh, household level statistics from the consumer pyramid survey. And so you can see that during this period, uh, the incomes were uh, higher and uh, expenditures of consumption were much lower uh, for every household. This is the main specification that we look at, our outcome variable, which is a standardized measure of nighttime lights intensity. Examine the effect of red interacted with post, orange interacted with post, compared to green interacted with post, right? So it's a differences and differences measure. We're obviously going to control for the post variable itself, but you notice here that I don't put in a separate uh, term for red and orange districts. That's because we include a district fixed effect. And so the uh, fact of being in a red, uh, red district or an orange district is soaked up by the district fixed effect. Um, this hopefully also controls for things like, uh, you know, the level of development being different between orange and uh, red districts or any other kind of observable or unobservable characteristic about a district that you can think about, we have hopefully so soaked up in this district. Um, we include a vector of observable characteristics of each uh, um, district, which varies over time. So the district fixed effect accounts for those things which are, don't vary over time. So we have to include for the, those things which might vary over time. And so this is specifically district level monthly infections. So we want to control for those. Um, 
And also what we do is we include a vector of district level monthly nighttime lights from 2013 to 2019. The whole vector of uh, for six years in the prior period, we include as a control. And so this way we are able to, uh, uh, nighttime lights will obviously depend on previous period nighttime lights. And so we can control for all of those uh, situations, right? So um, we put in a state month fixed effect because a lot of the policies and implementations of, for example, health services or police to imp uh, or district administration is all under the control of the states in India. And so that is going to be an important uh, factor to control for in a national level study. You don't uh, you want to account for the fact that Uttar Pradesh, for example, had a different uh, health system, a different policing system compared to Karnataka, right? And so insofar that those things matter, we are going to put in a state uh, month fixed effect. And finally, our standard errors are clustered at the state level. So here are the main results. So if you pay attention to nothing else, please pay attention to this set of uh, outcomes. So um, this is the red zone. Uh, so first I want to show you the post uh, variable. So the coefficient of the post variable is positive and significant. It's also quite large. It indicates that India was in a recovery uh, from the depths of April's economic output to May and June. Um, so between March and April, which were very low level of night lights, to May and June, when the government started to unlock, India was in a nighttime lights recovery. And so this is why we have a large effect on the post variable. So the correct interpretation of the red zone districts, right? So uh, is that the coefficient says that it's a minus 0 0.043 uh, standard deviation, lower recovery in the red zone districts compared to the national average. In the green, uh, and compared to the green zone districts, sorry. Um, the orange zone districts had a 0 0.009 uh, standard deviation, lower recovery compared to the green zone districts. This translates into um, overall an 8.3% lower nighttime lights for the red zone uh, districts and 1.5% uh, uh, lower nighttime lights for the orange zone districts. We control for per capita COVID infections, but no surprises that this is very small and insignificant. This is because if you looked at COVID infections in April and May uh, across the country, these were still in the thousands. So any additional COVID infections in a given district really had very little impact on the um, nighttime light incidents. It's really these restrictions, uh, the zone of classifications which are biting, not so much the infection itself. Um, so I'd also point out that the specification has a fairly high R square, um, simply because we're including a lot of the nighttime lights, lagged nighttime lights from previous years, 2013 to 2019, uh, as well as the district fixed effects in our specification. Uh, what we've done here is to disaggregate the results of the post period into May, June, and July. So what we see over here is that the um, is May, uh, results are for the districts, uh, red zone districts are the, you know, the restrictions are the highest, the gap is the uh, widest. And so this is translating into a 12.4% uh, lower nighttime lights for red zone districts in May. And orange zone districts is 0 0.01 uh, standard deviation, which translates into 1.7% nighttime lights. Um, so between May and June, the gap start to narrow. Uh, so for red zone, red zone districts, these went from, um, 0 0.06 standard deviation down to 0 0.04. In July, this was 0 0.026 standard deviation. So the gaps between red and zone uh, and green zone districts in the post period start to narrow. And similarly for the May, uh, for the orange zone districts as well. So what we're going to do now is to help you think about these results and be sure that these results are actually robust to a lot of other studies. So first, what we're going to do is to say that can we do essentially what is a pre-period test. So remember these zone classifications only came about in end of April. That's when the government announced these zone classifications. So whatever was happening in end of April should not have say had an effect in end of uh, 2019 or the early months of 2020. So in the pre 
COVID period, so in a pattern. And so this we see is that uh, you know for the red zone districts we don't see much of a pattern uh, that I can identify. For the orange zone districts we don't see right much of an. Uh, so we see no discernible pattern in the absence of the zone classifications. So we are more confident that these zone classifications actually are meaning something only in the April, in May, and June periods, not in the period. The second test I'm going to do is that of a border uh, districts class. Uh, test. So what we're do, doing here is that um, we're taking our entire sample and restricting ourselves to only those districts, uh, say a green district that borders a red district or an orange district that borders a red district. So if there's a green district which is surrounded all by the green districts, we're going to drop it from our sample. For a red district that is surrounded only by red districts, we're going to drop it from our sample. And so this means that we are basically comparing districts which are a lot like each other and geographically uh, similar, but they differ only in their zone class. And so what we see over here is that the border districts result is qualitatively very similar to the overall sample that I've seen, uh, shown in column one, the border districts is very similar. So uh, none of the results are necessarily overturned and the qualitative finding is essentially. Uh, you might be concerned about these big cities in India, um, Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, Hyderabad, Ahmedabad, uh, Bangalore, so on and so forth, which um, provide the disproportionate number of nightlights as well as economic activity in the country. So what we did is we took this larger 17 metropolitan districts um, and exclude those from our sample, and then try, try to see if excluding them has a qualitative effect on our results. And what we find is that it doesn't. Uh, essentially, you know, the coefficient itself is smaller by compared to the mini state elements change the zone classification. So for these 15 districts, which are located across the country, uh, the state governments reclassified them according to you know, their local perceptions from either a green zone district to an orange zone district, or an orange zone district to a red zone district. So uh, we don't know on which basis. We looked for a specific codified information if we can find it, um, but, but we couldn't find obvious reasons why the state governments were doing this. So one thing we did is to drop these 15 districts from our uh, data set and try to see if the qualitative results still holds. And the answer is yes, it does. In fact, the main coefficient uh, doesn't change much at all. So 0 0.403 uh, standard deviations is still 0 0.041 and 0 0.0094 standard deviations for the orange zone districts is now 0 0.0093, basically no effect. Um, finally, what we're doing is a placebo test where we are taking our entire data set of zone classifications uh, and scrambling the zone classifications across, right? So randomly shuffling all these zone classifications. Uh, so now you might imagine that, you know, it's just the researchers doing a random uh, shuffle. So the, in, the, in reality, now if I look at the shuffle zone classification, they should not mean anything, right? So essentially, if you ran the main specification again with these shuffled placebo classifications, you should find a null result. So, um, this is exactly what happens with the shuffled uh, red zones. Your coefficient drops to zero and it's insignificant compared to the main coefficient. And for the orange zone districts, the shuffled, coefficient, <laughs> shuffled zone classifications is uh, also dropped to zero. So this just offers us far more confidence that the results that we see for the um, main test are not driven by say spur spurious correlations in the data. And so we're more confident that this is an actual uh, effect that we observe and not um, okay so uh, let me check for any questions um, so Vimal, I hope that your uh, test um, is answering your result on data. So what we is showing you um, the result on that. So per capita, Priya uh, asks about per capita COVID infections coefficient is it significant? Yes. So um, our study so is restricted to the months of March, April, May, and June, right? 
And so in this is a time when uh, just the levels of uh, COVID infections as reported by the COVID-19 India website was fairly low. Now, of course, you can ask yourself all sorts of questions about the levels of testing. That might be a concern, but you know, for whatever it is, it does re represent some amount of information on the virus spread. This is the best information we have. We put it all in the regression and we find that it's insignificant. My interpretation of this is that, you know, um, even in the most COVID uh, infected uh, districts, the reported level of infections at the time was in the few thousands. Of course, it's much higher now, uh, but it's because of the exponential increase in COVID infections in India over time. So if you go back to say April 30th, you don't actually find many infections outside of say Mumbai and Delhi because the two highest uh, districts, uh, even just dropping them from the data doesn't lead to a different uh, Okay, so now what I want to do is to check if um, uh, uh, on the channels to which this uh, restrictions are essentially mobility restrictions, preventing people from traveling, um, as well as perhaps you know uh, attending to economic activity in the red zone. So one thing is we want to check if the government's restrictions on mobility actually translated into people restricting their mobility or not. And so we are using this external source of data, which is Facebook's uh, location uh, information from the app that people download. And so Facebook is uh, collecting this and putting it into uh, tiles. So Facebook divides the world into 600 meters by 600 meter tiles, uh, essentially whether or not, and checking if people exit the tile or not. So whether say, the way I interpret it is to say, whether people left their house or not, or they left their immediate neighborhood or not. Um, and are these mobility restrictions binding or not? So let's take a look at what is the pattern in the data. So the first is that in the month of May, we see that mobility was much lower in May compared to in the red zone districts compared to green zone districts. And so this is 0.15 standard deviation decrease. So it seems as if yes, the red zone districts had significantly lower individual mobility uh, compared to green and orange zone districts. Uh, green zone districts. The orange zone districts, um, you know, don't have significantly different mobility compared to green zone districts. Uh, in June, remember, the government starts to unlock and this graded differentials, red, orange, and green zones go away as far as policy measures go. What happens then? What you see is that people start to move about much more, especially in the red zone districts where they were restricted, right? So the red zone districts saw much greater mobility in June which is exactly the pattern that one would expect, right? Uh, the orange zone districts also see much more uh, mobility. So 0.23 standard deviation increases in mobility in the red zone district, uh, 0.11 standard deviation increases in the mobili mobility in the orange zone district. Um, in India, by the way, uh, overall mobility was also increasing. And so this is just a function of the fact that India was unlocking, the government was uh, removing a lot of the uh, restrictions. And so you see this pattern in the data. And so finally, this pattern ex uh, accelerates even in July, for which we have data. Uh, this is the analysis that we do. So remember, our uh, main analysis was conducted with the nighttime light in intensity, which is collected using NASA uh, satellite. Now what we're doing is using the consumer pyramid survey data. And we're trying to find out the consumer pyramid survey data reports uh, at least the overall income and consumption for each household. It does also uh, tell us much more about the subcategories over here for income and consumption, but I'm only going to restrict the analysis to the overall uh, income and consumption. And so here what we see is that um, income was much lower in red zone districts uh, compared to green zone districts in May. Uh, uh, and so it was 0 0.065 standard deviations lower. In orange zone districts, it was 0.14 standard deviations lower. There's a considerable decrease in income uh, in these uh, in this, uh, districts, which had lower, uh, lower mobility and more containment policies. For consumption, um, there was no uh, big difference in consumption for the red zone districts in May. Uh, for the orange zone districts, the consumption was much lower in May compared to the green zone districts. In June, what we see is that the income uh, levels remain lower 
in red zone districts in June, uh, as well as the orange zone uh, districts compared to the green zone districts. Uh, what we do see is a revival of consumption uh, in June. Perhaps one uh, answer to this is that, um, you know, that non-durable consumption cannot be delayed beyond a certain point. So you do start to see, even in red and orange zone districts, people reviving consumption of non durable Okay, so uh, now what we want to do is to try and see how uh, local area characteristics has an impact on uh, the degree, the impact of the um, zone classification. So you might imagine that you know, various local area characteristics might either uh, you know, exasperate uh, exasperate or uh, mitigate the impact of these zone, uh, zone classifications. So for one uh, straightforward analysis is heterogeneity by population density. If you have highly uh, uh, dense populations, it means that the virus can spread much more, but high population density areas are also the cities and towns of India. So it might mean that that's where the zone classifications really bite, right? So that's where the economic activity is taking place. Therefore, if you restrict economic activity in the economic engines of India, that has a big negative impact on macroeconomic activity. This is exactly what we see. So if you look at the uh, high, me uh, above median population density areas, this is where zone classifications matter, not in the below median uh, population density areas. Right? So this is true for both for the red zone districts as well as the orange zone districts. And the difference between these is significant. Uh, we, uh, so the second uh, heterogeneity test we did is to look at services sector employment. So we're classifying all districts in India according to the fraction of the working population, which is working in the services sector versus not. The reason why we pick the services sector is because we think that, you know, if you want to implement work from home, then you can do it much more easily in the services sector compared to say manufacturing or mining or certainly agriculture, where work from home is just not possible. So it could be that if you have high services sector employment, then uh, these zone restriction policies don't have so much bite. On the other hand, service sector employment is also a proxy for high economic value. Right? So it could be that when you restrict your most productive employees from working, then you see much more bite on the uh, macroeconomic activity compared to other ones. So that motivates us to look at services sector employment and heterogeneity by that. What we find is that the zone classifications bite much more in the above median uh, services sector employment districts compared to those which are below median. The orange zone districts, again, the same similar story. This is much more uh, in the zone classification has much more uh, greater effect in the uh, above median uh, districts compared to the below median districts. Okay? Uh, I would caution that these, uh, these two coefficients are not statistically different from each other. But the way I see it is that there is above median versus below median without being statistically different. Um, we're also looking at age. So what happens if you have older populations? The older populations are much more vulnerable to the virus. So mobility, maybe they, even with the mobility rest, uh, restrictions or lack thereof, uh, they did not change their behavior. They always stayed at home. Um, it could be therefore that older populations are not so much affected. On the other hand, it could also be that older population just basically earn more, right? So there is a age structure to earnings. Uh, young people just earn less, their economic value is lower. Older people earn more, so their economic value is greater. So where does the uh, restrictions bite? And so we certainly can see that the restrictions bite more in the above, uh, in the older districts compared to the younger districts. Again, I'd caution uh, that the two coefficients are not statistically different from each other. I'm just saying that the above median difference uh, the coefficient is larger than the below median uh, coefficient. And finally, we're trying to see uh, bank credit. So bank credit could be a nice proxy for access to finance. Uh, this is the uh, you know, perhaps a way to mitigate the impact. So having access to financial services is a way to mitigate the impact of um, government restrictions, or it could also mean that the uh, districts which are tend to take, get a lot of bank credits are the economically well-developed districts. And so the uh, zone containment policies impact them much more. And what we find is that it's more of the latter story that the zone containment policies restricted uh, the districts with bank credit much more compared to those which got higher bank credit. So in conclusion, 
Uh, this is what the findings are. Uh, what we did in this paper is to estimate the impact of the uh, differential zone containment policies. So these are red, orange, and uh, green zones. So if you're living in India, you might have, you know, on May 4th, been frantically checking your district and trying to understand which way, um, which way the, uh, which uh, classification you were in. So we are trying to see what is the effect of being in a red zone compared to a green zone um, and orange zone versus the green zone in the post period compared to the pre period. And so we are implementing this differences and differences design. And our main outcome variable for economic activity is nighttime light. Our main result is that uh, the nighttime lights declined or did not increase as much as the national increase um, in the red zone districts. They were, the increase was 0 0.043 uh, standard deviation lower in the red zone districts compared to the green zone districts and 0 0.009 standard deviation lower for the orange zone districts compared to the green zone districts. We find that there are persistent income gaps between the zones. And so that's important to note. Uh, this consumer pyramid uh, survey says that income, which is a combination of employment and wages, um, remains low for the red and orange zone districts compared to the green zone districts. So consumption was lower in May for the red uh, orange zone districts, but all of these measures rebounded in uh, the subsequent months in uh, June and July. So we also looked at heterogeneity uh, and uh, we see larger impacts of these uh, zone containment policies in districts with greater population density, with older residents, more services employment and bank growth. Okay. So that's the summary of our paper. Um, so happy to answer questions, but I also look forward to Prachi's comments right now. Uh, we will be uh, taking notes Prachi uh, and uh, happy to hear what you think. Thanks Tarun. Uh, Prachi, over to you. Uh, if anybody doesn't know who Prachi is, Prachi is at the research department at the IMF and she needs to be unmuted. So I'm going to unmute her right now. Prachi, over to you. Thank you, Kaushik. Let me um, share my screen. Uh, am I audible and can you see the screen? Yes. Um, so first of all, Kaushik, thank you for organizing this and pleasure to be here. And thank you, Tarun. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I hope, you know, um, I hope my comments will be helpful uh, in terms of taking the paper forward. Let me see if I can move the slide, yes. Um, so, so, so let me start by summarizing. I think Tarun did a great job in presenting the paper. It was very detailed. Um, I'll, I'll be very quick uh, in just summarizing uh, what the paper does. Uh, so basically uh, what the paper does is, um, you know, look at uh, the effect of this ROG, as I'll call, red, orange, and green classification post-COVID on economic activity in India? That's, that, that's the big question which uh, uh, you know, the, the paper, paper tries to answer. What is the methodology? It's um, basically a difference in difference. Uh, so interacting, and as you know, Tarun said, state, straightforward uh, paper, clearly written, well presented. Um, so basically what um, uh, you know, Tarun, uh, Robert, and um, uh, Sonalika do is they interact um, these ROG dummies with um, you know, the post um, uh, sort of, you know, post uh, this classification um, uh, time dummies, uh, particularly, you know, dummies for May, June, and July. Um, and, you know, several outcome indicators. I think the main, and the main is uh, the nighttime uh, light intensity, which I think uh, Robert has worked a lot on. I think uh, I've used it, uh, thanks to Robert, I've used it in a previous paper of mine as well. Um, and, and, and so that is the main outcome variable. And then, uh, you know, there are different channels um, and uh, th through which um, what, what Tarun and co-authors call channels is basically look at mobility um, uh, from uh, Facebook and income and expenditures uh, from um, the consumer pyramids. Again, I have to say that, um, uh, you know, all of these are excellent data sets and, you know, Kaushik is doing a great job at C CMIE in, uh, a, 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 in, you know, in, in enhancing uh, the consumer pyramids. And again, I've been um, a beneficial user of this data set as well. Um, 
Main findings, um, uh, night lights declined or night light intensity declined more in red zones, followed by orange, orange zones relative to green in the post period. Um, similar findings uh, for mobility and incomes, but the results for consumption uh, are weaker, at least the overall results. And then, you know, as Tarun explained, it, it, it came down, then it, it recovered um, or during his sample period, during the latter half of his uh, sample period. And the third uh, part of the analysis is about heterogeneity, where you look at, uh, you know, older residents, um, you know, uh, districts um, which have higher population density, services sector employment, etc. Um, let me um, uh, uh, let me start by saying that you know why bottom line and you know why do we care about this paper? Um, I feel that you know the results of this paper are likely to be interpreted as the fact that you know containment policies were effective. So effectiveness of containment policies, meaning that you know mobility, mobility and activity were contained most in red districts which was perhaps the goal of these policies. So good, good news for policymakers. You know, they are gonna be happy to see these results. Look, this is what we tried to do and this is what we achieved. Um, in terms of contribution to the literature, I think this literature on the impact of COVID and policies related to it has exploded you know, there are more than 300 NBR working papers already, um, which are on the NBR website. So, so what is unique about this paper and how will the authors actually place this paper, um, you know, when you try to publish the paper or, you know, try, try to sell it. I think the selling point is, uh, you know, it brings evidence for in, from India. And um, India is a country which um, had one of the most stringent lockdowns across the world. So this chart, I think, is one of, uh, you know, it's based on Goldman Sachs, Gold, uh, you know, effective lockdown indices which combines um, uh, the, the Oxford stringency indices with uh, some of the um, you know, de facto mobility indicators. And as you can see, this is comparing to the Asian region, but even if you compare, if you, if you plot this globally, India does come out to be um, uh, you know, having, as, uh, having one of the most uh, stringent uh, lockdowns across, the, and it's well established and it's well known. Um, so here, um, I think uh, Tarun and his co-authors try to bring Fourth evidence um, uh, from India, which is um, you know country which had the toughest lockdowns uh, not only in Asia but across across the world. So my first comment, um, and let me make you know I think three or four com big comments which I think you know uh, may be helpful for the authors, and let me try to be constructive and also offer suggestions on what can be done. To me, you know, what is the big question? I think the biggest puzzle. I think what what if you look at the previous chart with India having one of the most stringent lockdowns, um, uh, you know, in Asia and across the world, the biggest puzzle in, in in the minds of you know economists, policymakers comes up in a lot of discussion, is why did the virus continue to escalate in India despite these very strong and de jure what I would call containment measures. As of September, you know, India still had 90,000 cases per day, which uh, new cases per day, which, uh, which Tarun also mentioned. And here, I think, you know, two explanations in my mind. One is weak enforcement of rules, which is also applicable to, you know, what Tarun is doing in his paper. Or, you know, the, the fact that, you know, you, you open li liquor shops on one day, you know, during this lockdown and you saw what happened, right? And the lack of social discipline, you know, mask wearing, look at how people are wearing masks, you know, look, look at social distancing. Um, so, so bigger question in my mind is that, you know, did these containment policies, especially this ROG policies, did they succeed in controlling the virus? To me, before I look at economic costs, to me, this is the first order question. You know, centralized rules in the early part of the virus, uh, um, you know, in terms of nationwide lockdown, followed by this ROG classification, did, were they effective in controlling the virus? And I think this is a question which, you know, Tarun and all have the data. They have per capita infection rates at the district level. And they can actually look at, um, you know, uh, whether, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, whether uh, uh, ROG districts after, you know, say the containment policies were implemented for a month or so, did they have, um, uh, you know, did our uh, red districts 
have relatively lower infection rates, um, uh, you know, compared to the other districts. So to me, this, this is really a first order question. And I thought that, you know, Tarun and co-authors have the data to address this question and maybe you've already looked at it and uh, it would be good to know before I move on to you know understanding what the economic costs were um, and, and, and so what's my suggestion as I said you know it's 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 the outcome a different outcome variable to analyze uh, would be the caseload in these zones and in fact if ROG policies were successful we should see a relative decline in caseloads for uh, for red zones and some movement. So what puzzled me was that, you know, uh, there is only 15 districts, you know, one of the robustness checks where you exclude the 15, 15 districts which shifted. I mean, there's only, you know, there's almost no movement across these zones. So meaning that, you know, uh, this, this actually, uh, you know, the red zones were red till the end of the sample period. So, so this would shed light on a bigger question. And this is, you know, as Rajiv Bajaj has said, India actually bent the wrong curve. It would actually, uh, it, 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 if, if, if you find that actually, uh, um, and, and I don't know, I mean, maybe the red zones did evolve and, you know, maybe there's some measurement error, classification problem, et cetera. But if you find that, um, uh, and, and just, you know, getting first-hand impression by the, by the statistic that there's little movement across, uh, you know, these, uh, these zones. Um, if you if you actually find that you know there are economic costs, but actually you know they did not um, uh, you know the, the rate of infections actually did not reduce, then it's uh, it's really providing an evidence for you know India bending the wrong curve and it could be I mean I, I think it would greatly enhance the paper. Um, let me move on to my second uh, comment, which is um, you know uh, measurement error con containment policies, and I say this for two reasons. One is, um, you know, uh, ROG presents a partial picture of containment, containment policies. And, uh, you know, Tarun himself discussed how, um, uh, you know, you started with a centralized lockdown, but from early May, it was highly decentralized. And these cannot be captured by state fixed effects because there were variations within states in lockdown rules which changed during the uh, Tarun sample period. And, uh, you know, and there are several examples, you know, Mamta Banerjee waking up and saying this district will have weekend lockdown, you know, alternate day lockdowns, northeastern states, you know, green in your map. But, you know, there were lockdowns in Kohima, Dimapur, Aizwal, Shillong. Uh, so I don't know, you know, what uh, if you combine the decentralized lockdown too, uh, what does it imply? You know, lockdowns in Chennai and uh, different uh, several districts in Tamil Nadu, we can, as I said, you know, we can lockdowns also in uh, not only West Bengal but Uttar Uttarakhand as well. Um, uh, uh, so, could it be the case that so, so one broader point that I think containment policies were not only ROG, uh, there were more than ROG, and India moved very, you know, quite, you know, after a month or two to very decentralized lockdown management. And this paper does not say anything about these decentralized um, um, lockdown management uh, policies. So that is one thing. And then, you know, the, the second point about measurement error is de jure versus de facto. And I think de jure ROG, what did it mean in terms of de facto? You know, how much compliance was there? As I said, you know, the, the de jure India's most stringent lockdown, the virus should not have escalated the way it did. So of course, there's a difference um, in in de jure versus de facto, and that uh, and, and that requires a lot of evidence gathering at the district level on how these containment policies were uh, implemented. So my suggestion would be, I think, twofold in order to address this comment. One is, um, you know, what would help is a very careful description of decentralized, um, uh, you know, containment measures. Sorry, it should be decentralized containment measures, and with the timeline. Um, uh, and if, if uh, include try and because you have district level data, try and include decentralized at least decentralization, um, you know, containment dum dummies. Second is an, is also an easy is, is sort of an easier route because you have mobility, so you can actually use instead of ROG dummies, you can actually use um, uh, you, you know mobility mm -hmm. patterns across districts. Yeah. To see, um, because that's a de facto measure of um, containment policies than a de jure measures. You could interact actually the um, the ROG dummies with the mobility patterns to get um, you know an overall district level uh, containment policy measure which combines de jure restrictions with de facto mobility. 
Um, let me move on to my, again, um, uh, the third comment. This is, um, uh, you know, of course, uh, when I read this paper, I, I think this is, is this capturing the effect of uh, these ROG dummies or is it capturing something else? And I can come up with, you know, at least a couple of alternative explanations uh, for the findings. You know, green zones had a relatively lower decline in economic activity because Manrega employment increased more in these uh, districts. I don't know. Or, you know, maybe agriculture did better. You know, one of the stories about COVID in India has been, you know, agriculture being resi resilient throughout this crisis, at least um, in the aggregate data. Um, you know, red zones had a relatively higher decline in economic activity because, you know, these were the zones which had the highest outflow of migrants. And I'm sure um, probably, you know, CMI data captures the outflow of migrants as well. Um, uh, uh, so, so I'm not convinced that this is really a paper about containment policies by just using these ROGs, ROG dummies, or is it something else? Um, again, my suggestion on how to address this would be uh, twofold. One is, um, you know, time varying district characteristics um, can be included. And sorry if you already included it and I missed it. And as, as I said, you know, as I said in my earlier, you know, more evidence on enforcement and compliance of these rules um, in the ROG zones. Um, my fourth comment is, you know, really these, um, you know, econometric uh, quibbles, uh, parallel trends. Now, this late, you know, most recent paper by Can Lang and Lang, which uh, says that, look, uh, uh, the presence of parallel trends in the free period does not guarantee that these trends would have continued in the absence of treatment. I think they have, you know, Can Lang and Lang at least have, you know, some simple suggestions that, look, add a linear trend interacted with group, uh, group, group membership to see um, what else. At least, you know, there has to be a, ref a reference to, um, again, sorry if I miss it, there has to be a, a reference to what the common criticism of uh, the D DIDR and how you try to address them. Again, clustered standard errors, 30 clusters, roughly 30 cl clusters for the states. It's a huge finite sample, um, you know, finite sample bias issue. Um, uh, again, um, there's LZ2 correction, which you can do. And third is, uh, this, uh, this is again, um, uh, the, the Bertrand et al. Uh, paper in the QJE, which said, you know, there's a serial correlation in the outcome variables, and that, um, uh, that leads to inconsistency in the standard errors, bootstrap the standard errors. So these are, I think econometric quibbles, which you really want to do a state, make sure that you do a state of the art, um, uh, you know, DID so that, you know, you don't, you know, referees cannot, uh, you know, quibble on these. Uh, some other comments before I conclude, I think I was puzzled why, why, because CMI also has employment. Why isn't employment used uh, as an outcome variable? Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think these questions, some, some of the questions came in the chat also on per capita infect, infections. I think you use contemporaneous per capita infections, at least lag it, uh, because, you know, they are um, uh, totally endogenous. And I was, uh, uh, so the one place where you did find, so you'd give an explanation that look, per capita infections are not significant in the activity regressions because, um, uh, you know, they were very small during the earlier, earlier part of the paper, actually they are significant in the mobility uh, reg uh, regressions. And they're also um, they're significant in the consumption regressions. So that I think explanation um, was a bit inconsistent uh, with your findings uh, of, um, but of course, you know, um, it, 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 you know, districts with higher per capita infections had higher incomes. I think it's just the other way around. I think districts with higher, uh, incomes. the it's incomes. Yeah. But, so, so I wouldn't, you know, so, so I think that deserves more discussion. I think you discussed a bit in the presentation, but I think in the paper, probably the insignificance of um, the per capita, um, uh, per capita infection rate um, in, in the activity regression, and then no longer in the mobility and uh, deserves some explanation. I think this question also came up, came up in the chat. Why not use uh, Google uh, Google mobility data? Actually, I just checked, uh, Tarun, while you were presenting, the, it does have district level data. At least you know for the uh, for fifteen districts and all. And the advantage of this Google data, Google mobility data is also a sectoral variation. You can look at yeah, look yeah. at your food, where farmers, food. Huh. yeah, you know where where are they going? And so, so I think there is something to exploit there. And finally, I think you could do a rigorous you 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 look at border districts to actually look at uh, you, you you know uh, refine your treatment and control. I think you could do a proper econometric um, natural okay. process. Right. Uh, overall, I think I love the paper. It's a very nice paper and it's an important contribution to the literature. I think um, with some additional tests and some additional work, this can, you know, the, 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 this should do re really well going forward. So thank you very much, um, Tarun and co-authors, and thank you, Kaushik, for inviting me to discuss this. Great. Awesome. Prachi, thank you so much. Tarun, would you like to respond really quick? I know Prachi has to head out soon. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the the quick answer, there are two, uh, two ways I'd respond. One is to say that uh, the substantive uh, point that Sprachi is making is that, uh, can we un unpack a little bit about the ROG differences and say that we agree that de jure is not de facto, right? So how a red zone district, say in Delhi is being treated is not the same as a red zone district in Bihar, uh, certainly, or Tamil Nadu is going to be treated. So these are going to be some important uh, considerations. Uh, one sort of, you know, uh, quick answer to what uh, this is saying is that if, if it truly was that the uh, zone classifications were not biting on the ground, then we ought not to see the results that we do, right? So that's a result, reason for seeing a null result. But the more interesting way to respond to Prachi is to actually uncover how it is that the different zone classific, uh, you know, red zone districts differ from orange zone districts or look at variations within these types of districts. And having looked at that, can we do heterogeneity uh, tests by that? So for example, uh, and if we do that, we learn much more, right? So for example, uh, if we want to see uh, the effect of a red, uh, containment policy in a relatively agriculture heavy district, which might have Narega to help mitigate the effect of the containment policy. My suggestion is, and the, why don't we actually examine that, right? So we do have data on levels of agric uh, agriculture and employment by district. We do have data on Narega by district. And so therefore we can take a look at uh, heterogeneity by those, um, um, by those criteria. So the, uh, I think Prachi's presentation is yielding a lot of interesting new analysis that we can do in report and certainly happy to do it because all, almost all of it is actually quite simple. So that's my, so thanks a lot Prachi for your comments. Um, I know you have to go, but um, you know, if you can please share your slides with us so that we can go through them in detail and then actually implement some of the econometric suggestions that you have as well. Uh, Robert and Sonalika, if you would like to come in and make any closing comments, that would be great. And once that's done, I'm happy to uh, end today's show. Well, let me just also uh, thank you very much for, for inviting us to present this paper. And I think Tarun did a fantastic job in explaining it. And still all of the comments and questions you raised showed exactly where we still need to refine a little bit the story. And then you, you picked up the right things. And then I think we've got really excellent comments uh, from Prachi, um, amazing things that we can work on and add and that will make the paper even stronger. And, and this is the best thing for, uh, for authors to get out of a seminar is this really good comments to improve the paper. And we definitely did that uh, from this seminar. And so congrats for organizing it. Thank you for having us. And then good luck going forward with this. So Malika, over to you. Yeah, I think I echo what Tarun and Robert just said. Thank you so much for the presentation and for giving us this opportunity. And uh, yeah, we we'll look forward to incorporating the feedback as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all. And I will make sure that I give you a list of all of the questions that have come in, just in case you want to get in touch with any of the people that ask them and respond to them over greater, uh, over greater length. Uh, before I shut down for the day, I just want to quickly give a shout out to the next talk, which is on the 15th of December. Uh, it's on tracking employment trajectories in the COVID-19 pandemic. So partly uh, on some of the questions that came to you, Tarun, um, and this is again evidence from the CPHS. This is a joint work by Rosa Abraham, Amit Basoli, and Sulbi Kesar, all at Azim Prinz University. That'll be on the 15th of December. Uh, so uh, you will all get uh, invitations very soon. Uh, we hope you can make it. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you again, Tarun, Robert, and Sonalika. Uh, this was really great, and we hope to be doing more of these uh, as soon as we can. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kaushik. <laughs>